Hello, everyone. I am Ron Vale from Genelia Research Campus, and I'd like to welcome everyone to Life Science Across the Globe. We're completing our second round of talks of sister institutes, and it's a great pleasure to return to China and Beijing and the Center for Life Sciences. It is also my great pleasure to introduce uh, Yi Rao, who will introduce today's speakers. The world is indeed very small. Uh, Yi and I go way back. Um, when I was uh, a brand new assistant professor at UCSF, I uh, was on Yi's thesis committee. And since then, uh, Yi has done amazing things. Uh, he's had a very distinguished scientific career, uh, first in the United States and then in China. In fact, Yi's returned to China in 2007 to become a uh, Dean of Peking University School of Life Sciences was a very important turning point, I would say, for a life science in China overall, where uh, Yi has played a major role, not just in developing uh, uh, biology at Peking University, but throughout China. And Yi and Yi Gongxi were also the founders of the Center for Life Sciences uh, which is our, our current sister institute. So um, with that, I, I'd like to welcome uh, Yi and the Center for Life Sciences. Hello, I would like to add a bit introduction to Ron Vale himself. And the fact remains that young Ron is, uh, I'm a long time worshiper of Ron. When I was 23 or 24, Ron was 26, 27. He became a faculty while I was in my second year of graduate school. And his research on discovering kinesin in 1985 with four cell papers, four first also cell papers, remains a record that has not been broken by any living organism. So I would like you to all know that Ron is a young star in my mind all the time. What I've decided to do is that rather than peaking at 27, I'm going to peak at 67. So let's all wait and for my research to come up in the next 10 years. I'm very happy to introduce two members from Peking Tsinghua Center for Life Science. The Center for Life Science is a product of major reform in education research in China. It was spearheaded by Yi Gongxi at Tsinghua and myself at Peking University. Over the last nine or 10 years, we have some very good young faculties coming up through the rank. And today we are presenting two of them. And the first one to speak will be Yu Long Li from Peking University. He graduated from PKU before he went to Duke University as a PhD, as a graduate student in neurobiology. After his PhD, he went to Stanford to work with Dick Chen, who was then still at Stanford. Rather than working with electrophysiology in the Chen lab, Yulong started working with imaging in the Chen lab, and he made good progress with work that everyone thought was done in the lab of Dick's brother, Roger Chen. So rather than clear, clarifying who he really worked with, Yulon came back to PKU and did some stellar work on making probes for G-protein coupled receptors, which I believe he will talk about today. Okay, uh, I hope uh, everybody can hear, hear me. Um, and, and I also uh, hope uh, everybody safe and well in this difficult time. Today I'm going to talk about uh, some of our latest work and most of them are unpublished. And uh, let me just start by showing this image. Uh, Dama or cannibals, uh, probably all of you recognize. Uh, in fact, more than 2000 years ago, in the Chinese medicine book that is already document this uh, plan and is interesting in fact in humans. And one of them is Duo Si, that good appetite. And the other one is Kuangzhou, runs a lot. Probably the most interesting one and people are familiar with is that Ren Jiangui, uh, 
behold ghosts. Well, throughout the years, uh, cannabis or marijuana has been sort of distributed throughout the world and most latest uh, landed in North America. And now um, uh, has been legalized for recreation usage in a number of countries, for example, uh, in Canada and half of the states uh, is also legal. And uh, as you can see, uh, some places that people even host parties uh, for um, so the smoking of this, and it has a clearly interesting uh, psychostimulus effect. Even this is known, uh, 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 has an effect in humans. Uh, only in the last 50 years, we have a good uh, molecular understanding of its action. It's plant-derived uh, materials tapping into the endogenous cannabinoid systems where the, our body, our, including our brain, that synthesize and release endocannabinoids. For example, 2AG and AEA, these lipid-like molecules. And they act on the receptors, the seven transmembrane uh, G-protein couple receptors, CP1 and CP2, the, uh, the predominant ones. And we also know a lot about their metabolism, synthesis, degradation, and transporters. At the nervous system, at the synaptic level, where the neuronal communication occurs, the endocannabinoid has this interesting effect serving as a retrograde signals. Rather than conventional transmitter release from a pre neuron to act on the post neuron, cannabinoids are synthesized upon the post neuron activation and then diffuse back to the pre terminal inhibit the transmitter release through acting on CB1, CB2, these GI couple receptors. So this is an interesting feedback inhibition that it plays. So clearly we know a lot about the endocannabinoid systems. But what we don't know, uh, I would argue, is how this endocannabinoid dynamics really happen in the living brain and at which time they are released, how long they last. Uh, how far they diffuse, and in disease condition or in our sort of high moment, how do they really sort of diffuse or synthesis? And to get these things, we need to use good tools. As Confucius says more than 2,000 years ago, Gong Yi San Qi Si, Bi Xin Li Qi Qi, that the good tools are you know, um, important to get things done. And for scientific research, uh, Sidney Brandner also pointed out that new tools can lead to new discovery and maybe new conceptual advancements. The existing methods for measure cannabinoid are all limited. For example, the gold standard electrophysiology methods cannot easily apply in vivo. You also don't have the spatial resolution, cannot have this long-term non-invasive measurements. Microdialysis method that has also been used to dialyze out the brain uh, material for chemical determinations. But it's really slow. It's typically sample uh, every five minutes or 10 minutes. So cannot capture this rapid dynamic real-time changes in the brain. To make things worse, the endocannabinoids are lipid-like molecules, so their solubility in solution are low, making it even more challenging to match. So how can we do these measurements and do it in a sort of a living brain to achieve sensitivity, specificity, good spatial and temporal resolution, and also uh, hopefully with uh, minimum invasiveness to allow one to repeatedly measure in the same set of cells during behavior or in the disease models? Well, one of the ways my, we might just think of looking at how our body detects cannabinoids. As I mentioned, we use the seven transmembrane G-protein couple receptors. In the last five years, structure study has really provided detailed understanding into the activation or detection of the endocannabinoid by the GPCRs, CB1 receptor or CB2 receptor. Upon endocannabinoid binding, this seven transmembrane protein uh, will change its conformation and couple with a downstream G protein. And importantly, this transmembrane 6 will undergo this largest conformational change to allow 
is posed of intracellular hole that G protein can engage. So we thought if we can tap into nature's design to use the CB1 receptor as a backbone, rather than allow this to couple with G protein, if we can sort of a hooking a frozen protein or optical output, and if through molecular engineering, we can couple them really well, that is upon the ligand binding, this conformational change of the CB1 receptor will lead to conformational change of the residue close to the chromophore of the conformational sensitive GIP. Then this GIP will emit forces. This will tell us whether there's enough amount of uh, the 2AG or AEA. If this works, this could really be a wonderful tool to study in the cannabinoid dynamics with, with good spatial temporary resolution because the whole system is genetically encodable, so we can use genetic tools to put them into a cell of interest. And we also really use nature's design to have the endocannabinoid sensitivity and the right affinity. This is how we did. To make a long story short, we identified the places that are really undergo the largest conformational change and and modify the linker that connects the CPGIP, the conformational sensitive GIP, with this receptor. We also uh, optimize the residues surrounding this chrome form and make it brighter and have a larger frozen signal changes. We also change the ligand binding pocket to also tune its affinity. Importantly, we also make the point notation that it do not uh, bind to the endocannabinoid, but still have the fluorescence. But the fluorescence just is not changing upon cannabinoid concentration changes. This can serve as a control. In culture cells, we can readily detect the cannabinoid sensors reporting to AG or AEA with a fluorescence increase, and the mutant sensor do not change its fluorescence. If we apply a number of other neurotransmitters, this sensor do not respond and they only respond to AEA and 2AG, just like the native CB1 receptor, and with a similar affinity difference. Importantly, it's really specific inter, uh, detections because the sensor antagonist, or the CB1 antagonist, the AN251 compound, will sort of compete out the sensor or the ligand binding and reduce the frozen to zero. We measure the kinetics of this sensor and finding out that if we puffing locally, rapidly puffing the agonist, the only is in the range of 1.6 seconds and, and offer it at around 10 seconds. And it's faster at even uh, at a uh, physiological 37 degree. So these kinetics are already 500 times uh, better than the conventional uh, microdialysis methods. So we then use this again, initially in a more simplified system to test whether we can detect the cannabinoid signal. We use two color imaging in culture uh, hippocampal neurons, which they form spontaneous network and will also release uh, cannabinoids. As you can see, if we stimulate the neuron, we can readily observe reference increase and decrease as the calcium rise and decay. And in green, in green we can also see the force and increase reflecting the cannabinoid release and diffuse. And if we pull them together, you can see that the red signal that precedes the green signal. And if we vary the stimulation strength, we can clearly see a very good correlation of the calcium level in red at the bottom X axis and the cannabinoid signal on the Y axis. So this confirms the classic sort of uh, understanding that the calcium influx in the post neurons can trigger the synthesis of a cannabinoid. Having this sensor, it has the spatial resolution. So we really looking at in the sort of culture dish where neurons from this spontaneous network, what is their cannabinoid dynamics? We see this interesting sort of flashings in the culture dishes. And this is really reflecting cannabinoid being released because Using the AM drug, this flashes is gone. At the end of the experiments, if we put in the uh, agonist, we see the flashing out, uh, uh, the, the total increase of all the sensors and the 
increase of sensor signal can be sort of blocked if we apply the antagonist. And this is really a local response if we quantify it, and we see that their diameter is in the range of 11 microns. So this really suggests this lipid-like molecule, which is thought to be sort of work in a local diffraction because their hydrophobicity can sort of diffuse in a proximity of 10 micron-ish range to act uh, in the presynaptic terminal to inhibit the transmitter release in a uh, semi-synaptic specific fashion, but not just at a single synapse, presumably a cluster of synapses within this 10 micro range. We are excited that this uh, new sensor can already sort of reporting uh, this uh, signal with a spatial resolution. How about this sensor's performance in vivo? In collaboration with Dr. Lee Bo's group at the Cold Spring Harbor, we uh, measure the cannabinoid signal using this AV, AV mediated expression in the basal letter amygdala, a uh, brain center known to process emotion like, including fear uh, like uh, 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 emotions. Using the fiber photometry, then we can subject the mice to a full shock. Upon a full shock, we readily observe the green signal increase and then goes back to the baseline. As a control, the amateurs in red do not have this tongue lock or significant tongue lock frozen changes. We can do that over and over again. And again, in green, reporting by the cannabinoid 2.0 sensor, we can see this really reliable uh, frozen increase. This indeed is the cannabinoid signal because the mutant sensor that is pressed do not have this sort of uh, full shock trigger responses. And if we look at this kinetics, the rest time is in the range of uh, one second. So the sensor itself will be faster than this uh, reporting the kinetics. We also trying to use this sensor to look at, at with a spatial resolution in vivo, how the cannabinoid dynamics change in behavior. In collaboration with uh, Evans group at Stanford, we look at the hippocampus uh, in living brain uh, using two photon imaging in mouse. As you can see that the sensor are co-expressed with a genetic function invention, GR-Gecko-1A, a red calcium indicator in hippocampus. And then we put this mouse in the treadmill and observing the frozen signal in red, which is calcium, and in green is our cannabinoid sensor signals. As you can see that when the mouse starts to run, we observe the calcium signal increase, which is followed by a slower green rise of the cannabinoid signal. And this is indeed a cannabinoid rise because in the control condition, the mutant sensor do not have such increase, even though the calcium signal still remain the same. And if the mice stops, the signal goes down. So this is sort of a reminiscent of what I mentioned earlier that in humans that people at, at, at least was documented that it likes to run a lot. And well, in this case, we see there's a sort of cannabinoid dynamics happening in the hippocampus, the GPS of the brain. We're also trying to look at in a more disease-like condition, for example, in seizure. Using the Kindle model, which is a so the seizure mode in rodents, again in hippocampus. Electrical stimulation can trigger seizure and we can measure the local field potential, which is showing on the top. Interestingly, if we look at in this condition when mice undergoing this seizure uh, disease-like state, we saw this traveling wave of a cannabinoid signal. That's the cannabinoid wave that travel from one place to the other. And this is a, uh, sh on, uh, showing that for different mouse that, that we uh, consistent uh, observe this uh, wave, cannabinoid wave, which it follows with the calcium wave. And this is really interesting. Again, uh, nobody has ever seen that before. So uh, Ivan and our group are studying what does that mean for the brain and whether it's serving as any sort of clue to study epileptic activity and also uh, is there anything to uh, to understand for therapeutic purpose. Can we do better? Well, as I mentioned, 2AG and EA are both the, the endogenous ligand, and their structure are similar except this head group. The 
the CB1 receptor from human recognize both. Well, the evolution might just have its own purpose, but can we do, do better for research? For example, to design sensors more specific for 2AG or for AEA. Again, the structure studies provide some molecular basis for their recognition. In collaboration with Song Chen's lab at uh, uh, PKU, and using also semi-rational screening, we, we mutate the size that, that are thought to be close to the, the head group. And lo and behold, we have some exciting better sensors. For example, we have the AEA 1.0, that with one single point mutation, that it has better response to AEA and much less response to 2AG than the sort of a native uh, uh, CB1 receptor-based sensor. And also with a different mutation, in this case, we have a sort of a similar response of 2AG, but significantly reduced AEA response. And we are further engineering this uh, to make it even more selective. And we think these are very useful to study the function of a cannabinoid in the uh, living brain and also in the body uh, in other parts. Just to summarize a, a little bit, using this new tool, we already readily observed this interesting lipid-like model, sort of, a, and we already observed that they are action in time and in space, which is very different from, for example, classical glutamate or GABA, these are synaptic transmitters. And presumably they are also different from a neural peptide, which uh, uh, sought to be more volume transmission. And this cannabinoid signal has a clear psychostimulus effect that uh, sort of uh, uh, in our brain that work in this interesting way. We also uh, uh, deposit our work uh, in the uh, recent bioarchive uh, 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 preprint, and we are happy to share this uh, 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 sensor uh, to offer you uh, for testing and use and for your own research. Let me, in the last uh, less than 10 minutes, let me just talk about uh, our other uh, progress of the tool making. Well, if you look at the G protein couple receptors, in the last 15 years, the structure studies yield insight of their sort of a molecular basis of recognition of ligand and signal transduction. And for different G-protein couple receptors, even though they detect different ligands, for example, rhodopsin actually has a, a important for vision that has a covalent bound ligand. But all of them share the same function is to couple with G-protein. And structurally, it's all these transmembrane six uh, that are rotating out and undergo these largest conformational changes. And in fact, our sensor that I was showing you earlier is really linked to the conformation of sensitive force and protein critically to this transmembrane 6 to have the largest sort of force and signal change. And because of the G-protein couple receptors really detect uh, many different chemical uh, 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 properties, substance, ranging from monoamines, peptide, lipid, amino acid, purines. So we thought, can we harness the conserve structure changes to make sensors for all of these different chemical property ligands. And can we also make a different color of sensors that can enable simultaneous detection of them in vivo. And this will really uh, provide important tools to study this uh, molecule with cell type specificity, with the chemical specificity in the brain. Also, throughout the brain, in, uh, throughout the body, or in other organs that they also need to communicate through GPCR for, for, the, uh, for the function. Indeed, we do all of that. Let me just show you some of our progress. For example, we make uh, acetylcholine sensors and also uh, recently uh, published an improved one. This is showing uh, during the sleep and wake in vivo in rodents, where we can use the EEG and EMG to decode the brain state. And at the bottom in green is showing that the hippocampal acetylcholine level uh, for more than two hours or even longer. As you can see, even this teeny tiny EMG signal increase signals awake state, the muscle in, uh, tone increase. You can see this tongue lock uh, increase of acetylcholine signal uh, 
in rodent spread. We also make a rare version of uh, acetylcholine sensor are busy validating them for in vivo uh, measurements. And it's also exciting time where well, we are making the dopamine sensors. Lin-Tan's group, initially uh, she was uh, at Genet and now uh, faculty at UC Davis, also using uh, GPSA, using D2 receptor, and we are made it uh, using D1 receptor mainly, and we are using D2 receptor. They make the sensor called D-Live for dopamine, and we call them grab dopamine sensors. And they also improve them uh, uh, to make the red version. We have our green version increase of the uh, uh, signal, signal up to 6-4 in vivo, and we also have the red version that can uh, report the in vivo signal uh, to noise ratio changes, similar as our green sensors, the first generation green sensor. This really opens, uh, provides a number of toolbox with uh, uh, different kinetics, different affinity, and different uh, sort of pharmacological specificity to study dopamine in vivo. We also make serotonin sensor, and this is showing the uh, example doing MDMA, again, a drug that's uh, being used in humans, that in rodents using two photons, when when we inject MDMA, IP inject into the rodents, we can see this massive increase, long-lasting increase of serotonin reporting by the square serotonin sensors we make. And using the ATP sensor we generate using this graph strategy, on the left showing that in the neural inflammation condition uh, uh, triggered by the LPS injection, we see this flashing of an exercise, the ATP flashes uh, uh, in the brain. And um, again, what does that mean? Well, uh, I'm not an immunologist, but with, I, I think this will be a very valuable tool to, uh, for the neuroimmunologist immunologist to, to study the ATP signal and the danger signal in vivo. And pr probably the G protein couple receptors uh, in human has 800 of them. The largest sort of uh, repertoire are detecting for neuropeptides. So we initially started with this monoamines, and now we have a range of neuropeptide sensors based on the graph strategy. And in fact, the neuropeptide dynamics are poorly understood uh, in in vivo. Now we have CCK, VIP, and SST. They have a uh, Fluorescent signal uh, EC50 in the range of a 30 nanomolar to uh, 0.5 micromolar. We also have AVP, MPY, NTS, CRF. For example, in the CRF, we have the fluorescent signal increase of more than 12 fold. And let me just show you one example of our latest oxytocin sensor. And this is a sensor that uh, uh, made by uh, my grad student, Wang Huan, that has EC50 of 0.2 nanomolar for oxytocin and has the frozen signal increase of 5-4 in cultural neurons and in sort of acute brain slice that, uh, uh, that we can readily observe uh, the PVN release of oxytocin in this slice in an activity dependent manner. And interestingly, the peptide release seems to be fast rather than the conventional wisdom that the slow re they are slow release. So we are Basically, starting their dynamics and not only look at their kinetics, but also trying to look at their spatial spread and also in the in vivo settings, how this oxytocin important uh, uh, peptide molecule and, and their roles are in vivo. Um, in fact, uh, by tapping into this uh, GPCR trait, not only in the using the human GPCRs, but also in uh, in vertebrae, like through flights to be said, we can make sensors to detect various uh, physiological important molecules, both in the brain, also in the body. And we think with these uh, tools, that it really provided uh, uh, the foundation for new discovery and for generation of new ideas. And with that, uh, I would want to acknowledge uh, my lab, my uh, grad students, undergraduate students, and postdocs. And the collaboratory work was uh, mainly done by uh, Dr. Ao Dong uh, in the lab. I also want to thank my uh, generous collaborators uh, throughout the world. And also our work is uh, supported by uh, uh, domestic and international fundings.
Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Yilong. Um, that was a great talk. I just want to remind the audience, uh, you can write your questions in the Q&A box and we will call on you to ask them. Um, while the questions are coming in, I want to start with a quick one. Um, obviously, it's very clear from your presentation why GPCRs are, um, you know, all the advantages to using them um, as a sensing scaffold in, in, in your, for your sensors. But I'm wondering if there are any disadvantages to using G GPCRs in this type of system. Um, um, yeah, of course. Uh, one of the uh, potential disadvantages is that uh, um, GPC is a very important signaling transduction machinery. So you can couple with the downstream, for example, G protein and different G protein depends on different GPC. So if one uses the GPC, one might worry that uh, you might atopically activate. Uh, unnecessary signaling in the cell of interest or perturb the cell physiology. And so that would be one worry. And fortunately, uh, uh, when we uh, uh, doing the calf, uh, characterization, we found most of the sensors that we generate uh, do not have detectable coupling of the downstream G protein or arrestin. Presumably because we are putting a bulky uh, optical output, this is a frozen protein, right at the conformational sort of a, a sensitive site. So this is sterile hindrance will prevent the engagement of uh, G protein or arrestin. And also another uh, worry that one might have, uh, I think for any sensor is that the sensor need to really engage with the ligand or with the sort of the uh, signal uh, molecule of interest, bias to it to, to report the signal. So this could potentially uh, uh, buffer uh, this um, important ligand that uh, that you are interested. In. And uh, this is uh, uh, unavoidable for uh, all the sensors that need to buy to the ligand to uh, transform the signal. Uh, we also do the controls uh, at least in uh, the condition that we test. The buffering effect depends on the sort of the affinity and also the expression level. So when we do the control experiment in both in vitro and in vivo, we don't see too much of the sort of a physiology effect if the, uh, the buffering effect is large. For example, we alter the calcium signal. But this is still something one need, uh, one need to worry about. And uh, one also need to do the control just to make sure that uh, the, uh, uh, this might not distort uh, your signal. And importantly, one can uh, sort of uh, reduce this concern by further increase or optimize the sensor to have even larger sort of uh, 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 sensitivity delta F over F and also with uh, a relative lower affinity. So in the hope that you, with this more sensitive sensor and lower affinity one, you can still report the dynamics, but will also reduce the potential buffering effect. Great, thank you. Um, we have an audience question from um, Carl Svoboda. Um, Carl, if you're there, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, you long. Can you hear me? Yeah. So this is yeah. this was a spectacular talk and great work. Um, so uh, the endocannabinoid sensor has this mysteriously slow effective on rate. Uh, on the order of a second. And that, of course, would confound uh, kind of space and time, right? So you kind of integrate endocannabinoids that can diffuse a certain distance, probably on the order of 10 microns over one second. So first, um, do you know um, how that, where that slow time scale comes from? And, um, and, 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 uh, what, what do you know about really, what can you tell about the spatial resolution, effective spatial resolution of that sensor? I mean, I mean, could some of these flashes be actually point sources of endocannabinoids? Um, that's really a, a good question. Uh, uh, yes, we also noticed this uh, sort of one second, and in principle, it could be uh, faster to really uh, uh, sort of allow one uh, deconvolute uh, the real signals. Uh, one of the uh, uh, the slowness we think that it might come from the actually the 
this unique GP cell. The structure studies actually illustrate this lipid-like molecule, uh, lipid-gated uh, GP cell, including the endocannabinoid and other uh, lipid activity GP cell. It actually has this unique mechanism where the lipid are thought to sort of diffuse into the ligand binding pocket into the GP cell through the membrane. So the lipid that are uh, sort of partici partition into the membrane and then sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, get into the ligand binding pocket. Uh, by consulting with a few uh, structural biology study GPCR, and they uh, they think it's the the the, uh, 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 the GPCR itself actually is uh, slower in a way to detect this uh, lipid, and uh, we are actually uh, uh, doing more engineering efforts. For example, to sort of open up the ligand bi binding uh, sort of uh, uh, entry po point, and it's still pretty mid preliminary, but we think we already have some candidates have even faster sort of a kinetics that allow to this DP might just get into the entry side and then uh, uh, have the sensor that have a faster uh, uh, on way. Again, it's a preliminary. And in fact, for a lot of structures that the people study for this lipid activity GPC, the lipid sometimes are thought to just being sort of encapsulated in this GPC. So the GPC the conformation changes are uh, uh, depends on the GPC and can be slower. So if this is the native GPC sort of the conformation that we think at least for the down, downstream uh, uh, signal, if the GPC is the um, um, uh, really limiting step, then um, our sensor could still sort of uh, reporting physiological relevant sort of uh, uh, signal. But of course, we want, want the sensor to be faster. Um, I hope I answer uh, uh, some of your questions. Thanks, Yilong. Uh, we have a, another question from Ahmed Abdel Fattah. Ahmed, if you're there, would you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. Uh, great talk, Yulong. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So, um, so I guess you answered most of my question when you're answering Carl, actually. But uh, from a like from a structural point of view, do you see a like which part of the of the endocannabinoid protein is responsible for that slow kinetics? Is it, do you see a difference between the other GPCRs you you made sensors out of in terms of structure? You know, um, specific. You know, is it the line, ligand binding event or is it the translation of the ligand binding? to the change in fluorescence uh, or a combination of both? Uh, so for most of, so the endocannabinoid sensor is actually the first sensor that is the p like molecule that, uh, that we make. We are, we, are ha we are having some of the other uh, uh, lipid uh, uh, activity uh, sensor in the pipeline. We haven't uh, really characterized their kinetics yet. But for the monoamine and other uh, sensors that we generate based on these GPCR confirmation changes. The on rate kinetics is faster. So uh, frequently we observe the on rate uh, is in the range of 50 milliseconds or even less. And, and therefore, I think we uh, need to uh, uh, more systematic study other GPCR just to have a, a better understanding. But for the um, engineering we did for the cannabinoid sensor that we actually really chop off some of the parts, uh, for example, some of the parts that even though seen the structure like at, at the end terminal, again, it's preliminary, but we think we thought the, the enhancement of the uh, uh, ligand affinity and, 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 and uh, uh, preliminary faster kinetics. Thanks, Yilong. Um, I think we're going to do one more um, question here from Shang Yu. Um, Sean wants to know, um, in humans, you need to run for a long time in order to feel good, but in mice, it seems that the endocannabinoid comes up as soon as the mice start running. Why then, in human, is there a lag in feeling good? Uh, uh, good question. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, our sensor uh, um, um, can only be uh, used in uh, animal models um, because we need to have really uh, uh, transgene. So, well, um, I I don't know. Uh, Xiang actually is an expert, so 
uh, in in uh, in uh, oxytocin in reward. So uh, um, I need experts to help. Uh, so please please also use our senses. Uh, again, uh, uh, you can contact me uh, for uh, more information or uh, reagents. So um, one last uh, quick question from an audience member, um, C. Collange. Is there a way to correlate delta F with the concentration of the cannabinoid in the extracellular space? Uh, uh, just using the delta F over F0 uh, is challenging because if the F0 is different, and, and so that would be corresponding to different concentration. Uh, fortunately, we have the sensors that are uh, ratiometric, so we can uh, sort of fuse a red frozen protein that is not sensitive to cannabinoid concentration and use that ratio in a way to measure the, uh, and calibrate the concentration. And because of this ratio measure, measurement would be more reliable to compare to the, the concentration across different uh, paradigm and also uh, in different animals. And I think with that, uh, that would be more uh, precise. Great, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we have to um, end the Q and A here. Um, but um, I'll post a link in the in the in the the chat box for our Slack channel, and anyone who didn't get their questions answered could go there after the seminar. Um, but right now, we're, I'm going to turn it over to Hang Wei Wang for our second talk.